Good afternoon, Tom. I'm so glad we were able to get together again for yes, another interview. Yes, it's always nice, Donna. It's, Thank you for wonderful. having me here. I was wondering if you would comment on some of the questions that some of your readers have had for you. There are sure. some interesting ones, so let me start off with that. The first one is concerning earth changes. You refer to earth changes in such a way as to suggest that they have a very high probability of occurring within the next few decades and will be significant to humanity and our evolution. Can you be more explicit and detailed about this? Uh, <laughs> instead, I'll probably be less specific and detailed <laughs> about this. I wouldn't say that I've said that it's a very high probability. Um, I did see uh, earth changes, particularly in the time that I was maybe three or four years into my association with Bob Monroe. Bob had us doing a lot of exploring in the future and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing was of interest to him, so uh, we did that. And I, one day, uh, where I worked, there was this large map of the world, and it was a, f uh, a flat map. It wasn't a globe. It was a flat map, but it was a big map, probably, oh, 12 feet wide and maybe, you know, 8 feet tall, that sort of thing. It was, it was put up on a, on a large wall. And uh, as I looked at it, at that time I was living more or less in an altered state of consciousness because I spent so many hours out at, the, out at the lab and then going to work on very little sleep and whatever. So I glanced at the map and just kind of noticed that it started to move. And as it moved, you know, I just watched. And I did see that the eastern third, probably, of the United States, you know, if here's the... If I'm looking at the United States, so this is east and that's west, and this is north and close to me is south, you know, so just looking at here. The eastern third with an axis right about down the Mississippi River just went, just rotated, just dropped down, okay? And I saw that, and of course what happens then is you displace a huge amount of water and send a big wave headed toward Europe, you know, toward England and Ireland and, and that sort of thing when you do that sort of thing. And then of course that leaves a big hole which then the water rushes back in. So you get tidal waves going both directions when you do something like that. You push a lot of water forward but then that leaves a big gap and a lot of water runs back into the gap. So I saw that going on and then out on the west coast I saw uh, similar sorts of things with um, you know, mostly this is big earthquake, you know, earth, earth shift sorts of things. So now we're talking about 1970, I don't know, 74 maybe, 75, somewhere in the middle 70s is about when I'm, when I'm seeing this. So, you know, 1970s, right, it's a long time ago. Um, anyway, we studied that at the time, Bob sent us out, you know, because, you know, I reported it and maybe some other people reported it, so he wanted us to hone in on it. And at the time, he said, well, when is this going to happen? And kept getting very nebulous kinds of things like, well, you know, we don't know yet, or we're not telling, or whatever, it doesn't, wasn't very clear. So Bob kept pushing us to find out dates on it, even though we told him that it just wasn't very clear. You know, it's a the future is probabilistic, so it doesn't necessarily have a date. You know, it's just, it depends on other things. Um, so, being pushed to make a date, um, we did make one somewhere in the middle 80s, like 1984. So that was like a decade away, say, from where we were. Well, needless to say, you know, the middle 80s came and gone, you know, and no such thing happened. Uh, but I have occasionally seen the same things repeat themselves. Sometimes when I'll go to a place, uh, say on the East Coast, and I kind of drift off, I will get some idea that that's going to be, you know, three or four hundred feet below water, you know, sometime, that kind of thing. I do not try to find dates. For one, I understand now that, the, that you know, the future is not determined. It's not deterministic. It is just probability. I think the probabilities have a lot to do with us, okay, the larger consciousness system, this is its simulation, so it can meddle with things a bit, 
when, you know, in, in the margins. You know, it's not going to do great big things that are noticeable, but it can meddle with things in the margins. So if, if we and all the other consciousness on this planet are progressing and moving and, are, and are, you know, our time here is paying off and we're learning and we're growing, they would not like, the larger conscious system would not like to then terminate that right at a point where it was starting to you know, move forward. On the other hand, if we were stagnating, going backwards, uh, didn't seem like the, prob you know, the probability of us growing up and maturing and lowering you know, our entropy, increasing the quality of our consciousness, I think we, I mean, we humanity, we consciousness here, if that probability was getting lower and lower, it might get to some point where it was, you know, too low. It wouldn't be a high probability of even making a good comeback. You know, it was going to kind of descend into chaos for a long time. Then the probability of that kind of a major destruction, which would be a big shakeup, uh, you know, kind of lets everybody start anew um, in totally different, dramatically different circumstances. Therefore, you allow for possibly a new outcome then I can see that the larger conscious system might want to, you know, encourage that. That may be a, you know, kind of what you need. Sometimes a system needs a, a good shaking up for it to do better. Sometimes it's, you know, it gets stuck. It paints itself into a corner. It gets to the point where it's not that productive. In that case, giving it a hard shake and, you know, tumbling all the pieces around and then saying, okay, now let's see what you do with this. This is different. You say, I've just changed the game. So I think that whether or not this happens, to some extent, has to do with how we're doing, how we as humanity are doing here. What are the pro what's the probability? What's the probability that 20 years from now we're going to be significantly ahead of the game where we are now or sliding backwards, you see? So those kinds of things, I believe, play in this date. So in the middle 70s, you know, we were we were getting like middle 80s might be a good time for this. But uh, then it just kind of kept pushing out, pushing further out. You know, um, so now the other thing is, is that people who try to, well, let me say it another way, looking for things like what are the earth changes, what are, you know, what it's going to happen um, because I want to make sure I, you know, my, you know, I and my family are safe, sort of thing, right? I mean, that's a guy's business, right? Just to keep his family safe. So if you have those kinds of reasons behind it, basically those are reasons of ego, right? Reasons of what's good for me and mine. How do I preserve me and mine? How do I get in the the place where I'm left with the, you know, the best opportunity and uh, and can uh, not only survive but do well. So it's all about thinking about how to make yourself um, do better. It's all about yourself. That kind of thinking doesn't always get I say, honest answers, doesn't always get straightforward answers. Okay? When you are playing that kind of an ego game, then the larger consciousness system sometimes will just toy with you. It will give you false information not because it's it's um, you know it's a it's an evil system but because that's good for your own growth if you get too focused on fear about what's going to happen okay then one way that it can throw some cold water in your face to get you to kind of come back to reality let go of the fear go on with your life is to give you a date that's like next year you see, now you'll go up into a, into a super tizzy, you know, you'll sell all your goods, move to the desert, you know, whatever, right? Then the day will come and go and you'll look around and you'll say, oh, I'm a fool, you see? And then you'll look back and maybe next time you won't be so quick to have all that fear. So it's, it's part of a lesson. It's not just that the larger conscious system lies to you because it thinks it's funny. It, it will give you misinformation because it thinks it will be helpful. It will actually help you grow if you have a, an experience that makes it clear to you that what you have been doing was bogus. It's not right. You know, so that happens a lot. 
that happens often to people who are engaged in, in paranormal things, like remote viewers. Okay. Sometimes we have, if you look in, the, in the, the history, the early remote viewing, you know, going back with Yuri Geller, I guess, and before him, uh, it was Pat Price and um, Ingo Swan. These were kind of the, the, the forerunners of remote viewing, at least in our in contemporary times. And you'll often find that they got very good at what they were doing to where their, their uh, statistics on getting right answers, being able to tell you what's going on at a particular place at a particular time, was very good, very high. So they had a lot of credibility, and there was no doubt that they were doing something that was paranormal, that it means not normal. They were able to get information that wasn't available to them in normal, normal means. If they get a little too much ego wrapped up in their success, if they get a little too high of visibility in their culture to where it starts to become a fact that this remote viewing is a real thing and works, well, then the old science certainty principle comes to kick in and the system says we need to tone that down a little bit. Uh, a little too much ego there. You know, they're starting to strut their stuff because they've gotten good at it. Well, pretty soon you'll have those people remote viewing alien bases, you know, on the dark side of the moon and other such things that basically discredit them. And all right, now they're not a problem, right? They, you know, it looks like they were going to make this such that people would have to face it even if they didn't want to because it's so clear that they are successful. Well, now they're doing silly stuff, you see. So that kind of fixes the science uncertainty principles problem because they lose credibility. But they're very much um, taken with this because the same kind of feelings, same kind of accuracy, the same sort of data and clarity that they were getting all the times they were right is now coming to them with stuff that doesn't pan out. Because eventually we fly a satellite around the moon and we photograph the dark side or whatever and we don't see you know, the alien bases and you know, the alien invasion doesn't happen the next year and et cetera, et cetera. So, that's the larger consciousness system basically teaching some lessons about humility, about ego, about um, you know, l not forcing people to see things and, and know things that they're not ready to see and know. You know don't be so pushy, pushing things in people's faces that, uh, you know, it, we do need to grow, but it needs to be gentle, otherwise it's not real growth. Actually, that tends to backfire. If you get a bunch of people and force them to see something they're not ready to see, typically you're worse off for that, not better off, because people don't just say, oh, look at that, what a surprise. Oh, now I'll just change all of my beliefs and all of the you know, things I've always believed and we'll go on to a newer and better world. It's not like that. People don't react that way. They react with fear. They react with more ego, more fear, it ends up being a negative rather than a positive. Mm. And uh, a little later, if we talk about communications, we'll kind of bring that up. That's one of the things about communications you have to talk about. Okay, so the fact that I got 1984 back in 1974, say, could have been that that was the highest probability that it would have happened around 84 because, you know, we were... Uh, you know, really, I guess the judgment from back from the maybe over the 40s and 50s and so on just wasn't all that positive. And sometime then, maybe in the late 60s and 70s or whatever, it started to turn around and maybe we were had more positive stuff. Uh, we weren't just marching along toward the same kind of negative things. So maybe there was a little more hope. And by the time we got to 84, it looked like, well, you know, maybe these people will turn it around yet. You know, let's let's let this game play out. So it could have been that, or it could have been that I was just given misinformation. Because if you keep demanding an answer, you'll get one. You see, when I said, well, when's this going to happen? And they said, no, nah, you don't need to know that. Or we don't really know that yet. Well, I needed to just take that as an answer and let it lie. That was the answer. But because Bob was real interested, he kept pushing his explorers out to get that information. And if you keep saying, no, I really want to know, give me a date, eventually, they'll give you a date. The date won't mean anything. 
<laughs> but they'll give you a date because it'll also be a lesson to you that you need to know when to quit. If you badger, you know, uh, the larger cancer system, it will give you a date all right, but it'll be part of its lesson to you rather than a bona fide date. So maybe I was given the 1984 as misinformation, you see, just to teach me a lesson. So the 1984 came and it didn't happen. I thought, well, gee, I heard that real clearly, you know, and then you start to rethink things and you start getting bigger pictures and then you realize that um, maybe you were misled or maybe things changed, but at any point, it's not really worth trying to figure all that out. Mm -hmm. The point is, that falls under, you know, you keep hearing me saying, and I'll say it again when we talk about kids, you, you keep hearing me saying, it's a very simple, a very simple thing we have to do here. Stuff happens, and we get to deal with it. Well, worrying about the earth changes that are coming, that's worrying about the stuff that happens. The stuff that happens isn't what's important. What's important is, how do you deal with it? That's the important part, not what happens. So if people are focused very much on what, you know, what this stuff is that happens and how can I manipulate things so that if a tidal wave's coming, I'm someplace else. You know, I'm on a high mountain that day. You know, how can I manipulate you know, events such that I win? I and mine. So if that's the way you're going through life, then you're missing the most important part, which is how are you going to deal with it? That's what's important. The, the stuff that happens really isn't all that important, and it doesn't really lead to any place really advantageous. But you do know for a fact that how we are, the quality of our consciousness affects our surroundings, and you're saying that the larger consciousness system may in fact uh, allow something like this to happen to just push the reset button. Uh, when you spoke of the floods and seeing part of the United mm -hmm. States underwater, and um, I thought back to some stories that we hear um, from the Bible in, say, Sodom and Gomorrah or Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. Were those kinds of things, did those happen from your historical uh, viewpoint from the fact that you can go back and check that in history and did it happen because this is what mankind needed at the time well you know I don't know I've never gone back and checked those facts that's sort of that's sort of the same uh, in a way the same thing you know you, there's this um, billboard that used to be real popular in the in the 70s and 80s and and that was uh, what was it uh, an inquiring mind wants to know <laughs> right and it was it was also another saying says you know um, well it was part of a campaign of, about uh, children you know it, it's a shame to waste potential right and an inquiring mind wants to know became a, a little well known jingle you know phrase well I just reword that and say inquiring egos want to know well when you want to know about all these things in history and how did that happen and you know did Jesus really you know, come back and, you know, from the dead, or did he really walk on the water? You know, are those things historical, or are those just stories, or what? And I want to know all these things out of the past. That's just ego wants to know. How is that knowledge going to reduce your entropy? How is that knowledge going to make you a better person? It's not. You see, it's just an ego. Inquiring egos, you know, would like to know. So I don't generally go there because it's just of no interest. You know, uh, it's that sort of information has no real value to it. The value is, is how you deal with the stuff that happens to you now. Now we can learn from the past, we can look at the past and we can see where uh, good choices led to good things and poor choices led to not so good things and we can learn by looking at the past. History is good, but going back to, you know, to, pick, to cherry pick specific events just because I want to know because I think it would be cool. <laughs> no, there's no point in that. So I, I don't do that. I don't look. Um, occasionally I have just because I've been goaded into it, you know, or sometimes I get asked enough that um, the, uh, you know, after the asker's gone, 
I might go look just to just to see what the answer was, you know. But I don't talk about it or I don't make right. much of it because it's just it's of no value. It's well, just Well, I think learning, uh, yeah, learning from what may have happened. Those were a couple of examples here from this question, but um, the point I think is, um, our, the quality of our consciousness does affect how the Earth behaves. Yes, is that right? We're all part of a big system here, and it's interactive. Now, from the one from one viewpoint, we have the simulation, which is you know uh, our universe and the big digital bang. So we have this simulation going and in this simulation there was this planet Earth and this Sun and it produced um, you know one-celled things and two-celled things and many-celled things and then it produced critters and lizards and fish and people and all that. So it produced a simulation that allowed pieces of consciousness to use the results of that simulation as constraints on a data stream. See, that's really what our virtual reality is. We get this data stream, and it's a multiplayer game, and how we're tied to this physical reality is that it's just a simulation. This simulation has been evolving, not only through the Big Bang, but through all the biological evolution, and as it evolves, we can use those possibilities that have evolved in that simulation as constraints. So we can only jump as high as the creatures in that simulation, you see, could jump. Well, humans evolved in that simulation, you see. So it's a virtual world. It's not that they're real flesh and blood humans running around, you know, in the computer or, or anyplace else. It's all just a virtual creation, a simulation. And we as chunks of consciousness agree to abide by the constraints of that simulation. So we're going to be constraints of that dog or that cat or that human being or that monkey or pig or whatever, that bumblebee, you know, whatever's consciousness, we can, uh, we can agree to be limited by the constraints that the simulation has placed on those things. So we can only think so deeply and so much. Our brains are only, you know, can only compute so much at a time. We can only hold, what do the scientists say, like... Uh, you know, five thoughts in our mind at one time before it gets overwhelmed. That's because those are the constraints that the rule set places on that simulation, and we take those constraints in. Those constraints are used to produce the data stream that we get. The data stream has to abide by those constraints. We can't get data in the data stream that has us doing things that are, that are not uh, according to the rule set, according to the constraints in the simulation. Are there basically two distinct but equally probable outcomes for this PMR, that's physical matter reality, that will set us off on an accelerated decrease or increase in entropy? No, uh, I wouldn't say there are two equally probable, um, you know, virtual realities there. It's not the way it works. That's an idea that, um, that's an idea that comes out of the many worlds theory that every time a choice is made, another world is spun off where that choice was made. So that there are, there are universes and, and uh, uh, shall we say, uh, realities where every choice is acted out. See, this is the idea of a deterministic reality. So everything that could happen does happen in these virtual, well, they're not virtual, these are all just split off physical realities, is the way the many worlds theory goes. That is not the case. That's very wasteful. That, that uses way too many resources that are unnecessary. It's extremely wasteful of the resources of consciousness. You know, it it uh, is asking a lot more computation because every time somebody, every time a, you know, a, an electron flips from spin up to spin down, oops, we got another whole universe that contains that electron spinning a different way. Well, a lot of these things just be redundant, right? They're just not that important. Oh, I scratched my head with my right hand instead of my left hand. A whole new universe because, you know, I may have just scratched it with my left hand. And um, every choice you make, you see, spins off other things. Well, you, obviously these get into lots and lots of universes with lots and lots of trivial changes in them that make no difference. It's just a big waste of computation power. 
that's not so it's not like we have the you know the good path and the bad path and they're both equally likely and you know we're on the knife edge of making just the right decisions some of that is right-headed in that it is true that now we have finally we humanity have finally gotten to the point where we have immense power to destroy we have immense power to do damage we have immense power to enslave and to restrict and to uh, you know aggrandize our egos and to force our will on other people we have all these you know mostly I'd say machines of war but they're not all machines of war some of them are machines of economics some of them are uh, you know machines of uh, you know cultural belief and other things but we've done that you know we now can have worldwide propaganda machines that uh, manipulate attitudes and things well that wasn't around even 20 years ago 30 years ago you know it's just real recent so we do have those opportunities for mischief that grow as our technology grows and enables them but at the same time we have opportunities for growth and for greatness you know are um, also developed by many of the same technologies the internet a great leveler so that the controllers have no control nobody controls the internet at least not for now I'm sure some are trying very hard to control the internet but for now you, you can't control the internet you can't control people's access to data because it comes out of space all you need is a you know is an antenna in your attic right it's um, it's hard to control information anymore so the same technologies that give us some of the scariest things also give us some of the the brightest things so in a way that is pushing us on a knife edge to where we have choices to make and that these choices well um, can have very dramatic consequences we can go one way or we could go the other because now we have the technology we could do a nuclear war and fire you know the the West could fire its the you know, 5,000 you know nuclear warheads and the you know I don't know whether the East would be the right thing to say but you know team A can fire theirs and team B can fire theirs back and there's be tens if not you know twenties of thousands of nuclear warheads going off all over poison the air pollute the you know the water and the seas and the food supply and we can do that we have the ability to make that kind of a world for ourselves you know in another hundred years after that would happen well a lot of the radioactivity would be gone not all of it and you know people would start to regenerate and there'd be all kinds of problems but we would regenerate you know we're pretty resilient uh, it's not that it would wipe everybody out it would just change life as we know it you know same with economic systems and monetary systems if they go broke and, and go to hell in the handbasket it's not that all you know humanity will die immediately it'll just things won't be the same way they were there'll be dramatic changes same with these earth changes things would be very different it wouldn't be like the way we imagine the 21st century would be we may be back to you know um, I don't know 500 years or a thousand years or 2,000 years as far as our infrastructure and and other things but um, you know we have a lot more knowledge than we had then and I doubt that everybody with knowledge would you know all disappear on the same day so we would rebuild and we would rebuild rather quickly um, compared to what it took us the first time to get where we are but yes life would be very different than it is now yes there would be lots of death and destruction and so on but we would not be gone we would come back now look at this from the viewpoint of the larger consciousness system if we are doing really well and together pulling together as a you know as a race we are growing uh, the quality of our consciousness then that kind of a big hiccup right in the middle of that would kind of be unfortunate from the larger conscious systems view it would be sort of a disaster because here are these people have finally got their act together they seem to be coming to a, a a bigger view about reality oh and then suddenly you know the you know big hole drops you know in the middle of the earth and you know problems happen and they get set back you know a couple of hundred years 
that wouldn't be such a good idea. So I would think, at least if I were the larger consciousness system, and I was, uh, you know, it was my simulation, and I controlled the, you know, the computers that created the data streams, I tend to tweak it a little bit because I'd say, eh, this is not, this is not profitable. You know, why do that? Or at least I'd hit the save button so that I could always regenerate it, you know, restart at this point. I mean, this is, this is digital. This is, this is digital, so you at least hit the save button. Save the and game. And then save the game at this point, and then uh, make some changes and start it back up. Say, well, okay, these people were working their way into this self-destruction. And when did it get to the point that it started to really go downhill? Well, right to here. Well, let's back it up to 20 years before that and start it over. And let this, let's see that if this time maybe they'll make different decisions and we won't have that impetus to, to run downhill. Well, that's what we do when, when our uh, system crashes, right? We go to, you know, we go up, uh, you know, on our, uh, what is it, uh, control panel, and we want to do a, a uh, you know, move it back to the last time the, the system was stable. You go and you tell it to, to go back to the system you move your system back to a configuration that it was last time it was stable. You didn't have that problem. Um, oh, yeah, right. Restore. Oh, yeah, restore. System so restore. you do a system restore. Yeah. Well, this is what you can do with digital systems. You can say, well, there was a big problem here. I downloaded this thing, and after that, all hell broke loose in my computer. I'm going to go back to the day before I downloaded that, that piece of malware that screwed everything up. And... Uh, you can, it restores your system, and there you are. But now, had you done whatever you did from that point forward, is gone now. If you downloaded some other software that you liked, well, you're going to have to download it again because you just went back. Well, digital systems are digital systems. Larger consciousness system can, can you know, it's got all the data stored. It can go back and re, you know, restart at a point and say, well, all right, here we are back. Um, you know, maybe a hundred years before the most terrible decisions were made. Now let's let it go again and see if they get it better this time. It could do that. And would there be any memory of it? Well, of course not. Does your computer have any memory of the stuff that got erased? No. It would seem perfectly continuous to the beings there. That is very interesting. See, it would seem perfectly <laughs> continuous. Now maybe if it went back enough to where there are beings there that had died or whatever, that's all right. You just have all those same beings that were there at that time, and you fill them up with consciousness. Why not even be the same consciousness? You just fill them up with consciousness, and there might be a little wiggle in the process a little bit, and a few people might change personality, but mostly you could, you could use the very same consciousness that had been inhabiting those bodies before, right? And you'd set all that back up, and you'd say, all right, you know, put the boards together and say, take two. <laughs> yeah, the human, human experiment, take two. So you don't know whether this has happened, or whether it's happened a hundred times, or, it, or whether it's never happened. It could have happened because of the nature of But the nature of reality. digital systems, right. yeah, that's the way it is. It's a simulation. You can always stop a simulation, back <laughs> it up to some place. If you've saved everything, and if you see things going badly, you probably would save everything, you know, just like in your computer. Your computer gets more and more unstable to where Word keeps crashing. Well, you learn that every time you write another sentence or two in Word, you save it before it crashes because once it gets unstable, you start to get better at saving things. And I'm sure the larger conscious system feels the same way about it. So anyway, there's all sorts of ways, you see, that this can, that this can play out. So this, oh no, the end, humanity will be lost forever, you know, well, that's just a little picture. It's not necessarily like that. You, see, you know who's going to be very interested in this particular point of view is um, Elliot and Maxwell. They're two young filmmakers in New York, and they are currently now on Indiegogo um, and about to raise money for a documentary called Life as a Video Game. And um, I think they will be very interested in this save feature yeah. well, <laughs> because it's, that it's is a digital what they're system. used to doing. <laughs> you know, there's lots of things. We keep thinking of this as something else. So the great wringing of hands, the great gnashing of teeth, the great needing to know, it's not as big a deal as it seems. You know, you don't need to know if big earth changes are coming. Yes, they are coming, and why do I say that? I say that based 
as much if not more on science facts that we know there's been pressure building within the uh, what San Andreas fault for a century now everybody says it's going to pop and then there's a big one coming because they can see the bulges and the pressure is building and building so we know just from a, a scientific standpoint that there's going to be some big earth changes here and there and then they run through major population centers um, that's just going to be life it's like that you know if you look at history every so many thousand years you know things break apart big earthquakes happen volcanoes go off uh, you know the earth is a dynamic kind of thing and forces have to be uh, have to be rebalanced so is that a different thing than the quality of consciousness there are some natural occurrences and then there are some occurrences that exactly. is based on how we these, act. these natural occurrences you mentioned are, are the rule set it's the way the rules are mm -hmm. you've got magnet it's a certain temperature which produces certain kinds of pressures and the the rock strata that's that's there has certain kind of porosity that uh, allows magna to come up and shelves you know the the uh, plate teutonics theory all these big uh, chunks of you know cooled crust that move around and bang into one another and that the uh, pacific crust or the pacific plate is going beneath the i guess it's called the american plate and as it does there's pressure building up between those two so these are scientific ideas the way they, that's the way the rule set works it's a you drop the ball you know it falls down it's just the way our rule set works however there is a possibility because of what you say about intention and um, that you can't since the earth is a living thing as well as we are we are it's it's a consciousness well, it's a living consciousness mm -hmm. then perhaps collective intent could shift that well of course i wouldn't necessarily say so much the earth being a living consciousness although that is a good concept but basically the way you know, it's a good i you know it's a good concept from the from the sense that we're all in this together we just can't think of oh we're the people with consciousness and you know those are the rocks and we don't really have anything to do with each other we and the planet and everything on it are all part of a larger entity. So that's true, but we don't, I wouldn't start thinking of the earth as a, you know, necessarily an intellectual being. Right. Okay. But remember we talked about you can use your intent to modify probable reality, right? The probable future. And that where there is lots of uncertainty is where you can make the most difference where the certainty starts to go away, it gets harder to move things, right? We, we talked about that. Well, how these plates push against each other and when that big one, quote unquote, is gonna happen, there's much uncertainty about that sort of thing. Well, with lots of uncertainty, that's where intent can do the most, you know, can have the most effect. So yes, of course, our intent and our intention has a lot of effect about the probable future, particularly where that probable future is uncertain, like it is with storms and earthquakes, lots of uncertainty there. Also, the larger consciousness system itself is running the simulation. No, it doesn't like to interfere with the, with the rules or the rule set or how it flows, but mainly it doesn't want to interfere with the choices that people make because we're here with free will we don't want things kind of butting into our story that we're un unfolding here but if you want to change a little value of the pressure at a particular point in the in the plate teutonic interaction well who would know right <laughs> it doesn't really modify anybody's free will you're just toying with the with the simulation a little because now you've just got a, an, an interesting game going, and this would just be a poor time for the rule set, you know, to do something like that. So you have a couple of things going here. People can modify the probable future with their intent. If their intents are positive, which means they're growing, they're learning, then that tends to create more positive environment. So things like pressures between the plates maybe decreases a little bit or finds an outlet so that uh, you know we have those those uh, 
better times that we're earning with our good intentions. You see, it's all about feedback. We get feedback. If our intentions are very negative and very you know, fearful and very self-aggrandizing, if that's what it's all about, then our tension would probably worsen the tension between colliding plates or maybe prevent some steam from blowing off, therefore building up more pressure because we're building up more negative pressure, you see? That's the way in which I say our whole planet is kind of one. We're all interactive. It's not just we're the people and they're, you know, and they're the rocks or they're the storms or they're the oceans, but we all interact with this thing. It says oceans give us oxygen to breathe from the, from the plankton that lives there. You know, we, you know, we fish the oceans, but if we fish them responsibly, then the ecology still goes on. If we fish them irresponsibly, then we start creating chain events with unintended consequences. Um, you know, it's that kind of thing. So in as much as we're responsible caretakers of this planet and responsible life forms that are here, then things will probably go better. So yes, what we think, how we grow, the extent of how much entropy we're reducing or how much fear we're creating makes a big difference about what happens, partly because of our intent, and partly because the larger consciousness system can you know, make some adjustments to the system, adjustments that we can't see, adjustments in things that are very uncertain and there's no way for us to know about it. But those things can happen. So there's, there's more than just one thing going on. It's not a simple problem. There's lots of various things going on. I think you've touched on the next question here, management intervention. I presume that although allowing an experiment to run its course is good science, there will be times when management intervenes to some extent, when it becomes apparent that to do so will significantly aid entropy reduction and avoid a probable spiral into high entropy. Are you aware of any such intervention presently or planned for the near future? Um, no, I am aware of some interventions that have already been done. Um, and of course, any good manager would do that. So let's say you're a good manager of a, of a corporation, and as a good manager of a corporation, you are not a micromanager. You, you empower your people to make decisions at their levels. And because you empower those people and you're not micromanaging everything from the top, you still have to watch, though, it's your job, right, as the chief executive, and if those empowered people start charging off in a dysfunctional direction, you might come in and give them some good advice. Well, folks, you know, you need to look at these other possibilities. And if they ignore you and keep on charging in, well, eventually, because you are in charge, you'll step in and stop, you know, something that is going to, say, destruct, destroy your corporation because you're the chief executive and you know I'm saying this is a business model that I'm giving now. So if you have a business model, even though it's good business to empower your people and let them go, that doesn't mean you let them go any way they do, anything they want, and if what they want to do is burn the, you know, the, the corporate office because you know everybody's cold and they'd like a nice fire, you stop it because you are responsible. You know, you're the manager, you're the you're the chief executive officer say. So you do have to assert authority sometimes, but you don't really want to do that unless you have to. You would rather empower your people, give them general guidelines, let their creative abilities, let their ideas and concepts you know, do the work rather than you, well, I'm the smart one, I'm in charge, you know, I'll run everything. You know, I want this is the way I want that to work, this is the way I want that to work. If you go down in your organization and try to drive everything with your own immense wonderfulness, you'll probably just create a very suboptimal, poor functioning organization. You're much better off to let your people run their organization, but you still have to correct it. So now, getting out of the, the management and business into the larger consciousness system, it has to see it the same way. It needs to leave us alone to make our own decisions, use our own free will, do whatever we do, because that's what we do. I mean, that's the point of the game for us to do that. 
But if, on the other hand, it sees things that aren't working out and the probability of them working out gets lower, it will at least start saving data more often. <laughs> you know, it will at least look at other options and it may think that, well, big earth changes might be just the thing. If you just let this thing go, I can see the probability is a 0.8 that it's just going to get so bad that it'll be hard to ever recover. In that case, maybe we need to throw a little, you know, monkey wrench into the works here. We need to shake things up a little bit. This would be a good time. So perhaps then you might think that big earth changes that kill, you know, 10 or 20, 50, 100 million people, as horrible as we see that, that may be just what the system needs. A little shake that uh, some big earth changes. So yes, no, I'm not saying this is what happens and that we're all, you know, at the mercy of the, you know, of the big giant who fiddles with us. That's not the point. We're left alone as much as we can be left alone. I'm just saying that these things are not impossible. One, we're working in a digital system. We're working with simulations that can be modified. Rules can be changed. Data can be entered. Oh, the pressure is 10,000. Mm, let's reduce that to 5,000. It's just a number in the computer. See, it's not that hard to do. It's, it's a simulation. So we have to see a bigger picture. And yeah. for we little people running around here, it's like, oh, it's the end of the world. Oh, terrible things will happen. If we don't fix this monetary system, you know, life will end. You know, we'll all disappear from the planet. And no, oh, no, no, no. You know, that's chicken little, you know, getting a little excited about the sky falling. We will regroup and it gives us other opportunities. It just may be different for a while. We may have smaller populations for hundreds of years. So this recent intervention that you're aware of? That was in the management level. That wasn't a physical intervention where it changed physical things around so much. Now physical things changing may have happened. That may even have been why the, the uh, 1984 time frame didn't work because interventions were made because the probability was looking brighter at that time. You know, I don't know. Or it may, like I said, I may have just gotten misinformation just because it would teach me a good lesson not to uh, take these kinds of things too seriously. Okay. In your books, you mention anti-rats. Mm -hmm. Could you tell the listeners and readers who have maybe have forgotten what those are or the people out there who don't know what those are, what that is? And uh, also, in your, your book, you suggest that these are part of the game that they're a deliberate addition by the programmers to create a more interesting and challenging experiment that will hopefully produce a greater entropy yeah. reduction in the long term. Yeah, it's not so much that, that uh, you know, I, I, this was a metaphor, you know, the, I said the, the good guys are the rats and the bad guys are the anti-rats, you know, it's kind of the, the anti-rats being those that are against the rats. Um, and I, I used that metaphor because earlier, a few pages back from what you're referring to, I, I talked about life as sort of, uh, often we feel like, like we're rats in a maze, you know, and we don't know which way to turn, and it seems very difficult for us to know which end is up, and, you know, what's, we can't even tell what's, what's good from what's bad some of the time. You know, we, we go off and do awful things because we think that's best, and we don't see that when we, when we uh, enforce when we force others to follow what our, you know, what our uh, ego says is best, it generally isn't best. So we can't even tell up from down a lot of the time. So I'm making this, this analogy that sometimes we're like rats in a maze. And then I talk about, well, there are also the anti-rats. And it's not so much that anti-rats were created and placed among us to add confusion as it is we generate the anti-rats. That is that is the, those of us that evolve to the negative side, or if you want to say de-evolve, however you want, to, you want to say that, whether you're evolving negative or you're just de-evolving away from positive, it's just a matter of words, semantics. But for those who are de-evolving, who, who are f you know, full of fear, power, ego, their wants, desires, you know, they see themselves as the center of the universe, that kind of thing. These are people who challenge us. There is a lot of negativity here that challenges us. It's easier to destroy than it is to build. What takes a hundred people 
a hundred days to build can be destroyed by two or three people in an hour. Building is a, is, is a lot more difficult process than destroying. So sometimes it's easier to destroy. Sometimes it's easier to steal than to work. You see? So we have these temptations and we have these challenges that we have to overcome. There's lots of things, there's lots of siren songs calling to our ego and calling to our fears. And if we join them, then obviously we become part of the problem. If we resist them and go the other way, then we become part of the solution. So that's what I meant in that. Not so much that anti-rats and poisonous cheese were, were put in the maze just to confuse us, but we create that in ourselves. It's not just a bunch of people full of peace and love trying to help each other. Our reality is not like that because we have so many people who have uh, not evolved very much in the quality of their consciousness. We have challenges daily. And these challenges um, seem to grow uh, in many ways. In some ways they're, they're dissipating, but in many ways they're growing. I mean, children today have a much different environment that they're growing up in with a lot more challenges that they have to meet, important decisions that they have to make, and they're only you know, 10, 11, and 12 years old. If you go back 100 or 200 years, 10, 11, 12 years olds weren't making major life-changing decisions. But now there's somebody out in the elementary school selling dope, and the kids have to decide whether they're going to go that route or not. That wasn't like that, you know, years back. Children were more sheltered from those kinds of choices. So on the other hand, they had other sorts of choices. You know, whether they had a bad winter and didn't get enough crops in, they may all starve to death the next year. You know, they had their own challenges. It's not like, you know, they didn't have challenges and life was peaceful then. We have different kinds of challenges. So we, we beat one sort of challenge in the same kind of thinking and technology and distribution that helped us beat that challenge creates now a new challenge. You see, and it's because it's not the stuff that happens that's important, it's how we deal with it. And if we beat that challenge, say of the drugs or something, another challenge will pop up in its place because that's why we're here, is to deal with challenges. So there are always going to be these challenges. This idea that we're going to make the perfect place that everything will always be perfect is probably not all that likely to occur anytime soon. You know, don't hold your breath for paradise. You know, it's going to be a challenging place for a long time. And that's partly because it's an elementary school. You know, it's not graduate school. It's an elementary school. There's always going to be... At best, sometimes. Yeah, at best. You know, sometimes daycare. Well, speaking yeah. of um, um, you know, enlightened um, souls, um, the next question involves uh, prophet souls, those, those people who came to earth, Jesus, Buddha, and others. Were they ordinary people, or did they uh, come in as very low entropy souls uh, to, due to the particular breakthrough efforts they made during that PMR experience packet? Which view do you take well, on that? Well, you know, it's a mixture of all of the above. Um, like, like many things that we talk about, it's not such a simple process that there's only one or two ways that things can be done. Often there's multiple ways in which things can happen. Some people come here with a mission. They come here knowing that what it is they want to do and you know, what it is they have to do are certain things. And that may be being leaders, uh, maybe you know, political leaders or, or uh, spiritual leaders or whatever, but they, they have that as their mission to be that. So that's like your case two, you know, your case B, where someone comes here already pre-programmed, if you will, to, to carry out certain kinds of tasks that are seen as being good here. Okay. There are also those who come here and not necessarily pre-programmed, but get it when they're here. Things click together, things make sense. They're in the right place at the right time in order to have a major effect. And at that point, they probably get worked with with the larger consciousness system. Tries to 
help them along, teach them, give them some lessons. I try to make them be the right person at the right time to help the whole society grow and learn something important, to give a good example. So sometimes they come already uh, set to do what they do. Sometimes they're, they're made on the spot because they, um, they have what it takes and they're at the right time and place. Other times it's some of both. Because you know when you, when you uh, have a plan and somebody's going to come here with some sort of plan to do something, once they get here, you know, the plan is only a plan. Stuff happens and they have to deal with it just like all the rest of us. They're not necessarily have any uh, magic that will force them to do the right thing at the right time. So sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes people come here with a plan and the plan never materializes. It just doesn't work out. A critical point gets missed. A critical decision isn't right. It's not a deterministic reality. So stuff happens. You mentioned that this is... Um well, just what we were speaking about, the prophets who come in to help mankind, mm -hmm. um, I imagine they don't come in with the same level of ignorance as we start off with. Why do we start off in ignorance? We, we do come into this reality with the quality of being that we have, but mm -hmm. it seems a bit of a waste since this entire existence is about experience and acquiring experience and learning that we start all over again with not any memory well, of that. There's a very good reason for that. Experience isn't what helps you grow. Not experience by itself. Just having an experience doesn't lower your entropy, doesn't increase the quality of your consciousness. And if it did, then you could take some DMT and get blasted off, you know, into the into uh, you know an, another virtual reality, and you would be wiser for the experience. But the fact is, you're no wiser at all for the experience. You don't gain wisdom just through experience. You have to grow up. You have to change yourself at the being level in order to, you know, evolve the quality of your consciousness. So experience isn't the key. So the fact that you wipe out all the old experience and start over with a new experience doesn't matter. Experience is just experience. Again, that's the stuff that happens, is your experience. What's important is, how do you deal with it? So you have all these experiences, and um, the experiences themselves are neither here nor there. Okay, wipe that experience slate clean. You get to keep all of the growth that you did all the evolution that you achieve for your consciousness, you get to keep that. You come back next time and you are that more evolved person that you were when you exited last time because you grew up that time, so you come back and now you get a whole new set of experiences. Any experience that challenges you is a good experience. It's one that you can learn from. So the point is of the choice. Now, you do have to start and go through a childhood you go from a baby to, let's say, uh, you know, an 18 or 20 year old where you're considered an adult and you can make adult decisions and uh, you're expected to be mature enough to, to uh, what, uh, deal with the consequences of your decisions. So yes, it takes a while to do that, but that's, so you might say, well, that time's wasted, you know, why do we have to keep growing up? Well because if you're going to start with a whole new set of experiences, which is good, otherwise you'd get dead-ended in a bunch of old experiences. It's better just to start and have a new whole set of experiences to work with than to end up painting yourself in a corner with a bunch of similar experiences, redoing them over and over again. That gets to, pretty soon you're gaming the system. All right, I've done this experience 10 times, now I know what the right answer is. Okay. So when that person spits on me, I won't pull out my gun and shoot them this time. You know, like Groundhog's Day, right? <laughs> he, keep having, he kept having yeah. the same experience over and over and over again until he goes, I think I'm getting it now. You know, I'll be where I need to be. I'll be kind to people. I'll be helpful. It won't be just about me getting what I want. You see, that was the key. And the problem with that, if you have experiences that just keep repeating, 
is you begin to game the system. Instead of changing, well, on Groundhog's Day, he did change. But before he changed, he tried just gaming the system. In other words, he wasn't changing. He was just trying to act like he was optimizing all these things. Well, that's what we would do. We'd say, all right, last time I got spit on, I pulled my gun, I shot the guy, you know, and that wasn't good. I lost points. So this time I won't do it. Well, now you're not changing. You're just acting differently. You see, you're not growing up. You've just learned this set of experiences and how to get through them by doing the right things, but you're not learning anything. So it's so much better just to have a whole new set of experiences. So you can't game the system. And the way we we learn how to interpret the data stream is by starting out as infants. Otherwise, we'd have this hard problem of interpreting the data stream. You see, you start out as an infant and you don't know anything other than you get some data. You don't know how to interpret it. You open your eyes and you see light, you know, and you can't focus on anything. And eventually you find out that this is a room or this is a bed and that's my mother and that's an apple and this is the cat and the dog. But you're learning. You get data from a dog and you learn that that's a dog. And you learn what dogs do and how they sound and how they move. And that becomes how you interpret the data stream. So you, you need to learn how to interpret the data stream. You need new experiences so you don't just game the old ones and become a good actor rather than a good person. So that's why it works the way it works. So you need to be born from an infant so that you can build up an understanding of how to interpret the data that you get. Are all the physical matter reality, I know you've, you have mentioned that you're aware of other physical matter realities, are they all the same system? Do they all start with the child learning that way, or do some of them start differently? No, as best I can tell, they're all pretty much similar in that sense. They start and, and grow. I, you know, I can't say that with a lot of confidence because often I don't stay around that long. You know, you go there and you visit and you interact and you're not really there for decades to see how things are moving through the society, but there's, there's usually the young and the, and the middle and the old, and it all seems to be very familiar. So I'd say mostly yes. Interesting. That's the, way it, that's the way it generally works. So you see why we need to have new experiences, why we, you know, we, we don't want to just keep the same old experiences, because the experience isn't so important. What the experience is, is not very important other than it be challenging. It has to challenge us and give us good, challenging choices so we can make those choices and grow up and better that they're new experiences. Every time we, we do, we run into things that are new, new challenges. And that's the way it, that's just the way life works. So if we focus on how we deal with it as opposed as to what the experience is, you know, and as, and as opposed to what happens to us, then we optimize our ability to grow up. Now we're looking at the end that is the growth end. Almost everybody spends all their time focused on the front end, what happens to us. I want to make sure that whatever I experience, it's good, soft, warm, and lovely. That's why I want to avoid earth changes. That's why I want to know, you know, I want to go look at the future to see how this will work out so I can pick what's best for me. This is why when, um, you know, Aunt Susie uh, is in an accident or finds out she has cancer or something, oh no, we got to change that. Let's all get together and use our intents and fix Aunt Susie. You see, we're constantly trying to manipulate what happens. And we completely ignore how it is we deal with it. Instead of dealing with the bad news, you know, with caring or with a big picture, we deal with it with fear. Oh no, we got to change that. We got to make sure that doesn't happen. We're not, it's like, well, how should we deal with this? Maybe, uh, you know, Aunt Susie, this is, this is her time. You know, maybe we should just go hang out with her, spend some time with her in her last days, make it really count. Maybe that would be the best thing to do rather than trying to fix Aunt Susie. So we, you know, we need to look at a bigger picture.